Miami pays its last tribute to Mayor Cermak of Chicago, who succumbed to an assassin's bullet after a brave fight for his life. Followed by his grief-stricken daughters, the body of the martyred mayor passed through the streets of the city in mourning. Escorted by a guard of veterans from the American Legion, of which he was an honorary member, crowds which watched the cortege head for the railway station stood in silent homage, an impressive farewell to one who was honored and loved by all who knew him. And in the background loomed the Miami jail where the assassin Zangara sat indifferent to the suffering he had caused as his victim was placed aboard a special train for the sad homeward journey to be remembered always as the man who gave his life for his friend, President Roosevelt. Sir Mac's funeral was unprecedented in, in Chicago history uh, to that day. It was a funeral like you never would imagine. The people were lined three and four deep all the way up to the... Uh, the place where the uh, ceremonies were taken, he lay in state in the, in the, in the city hall rotunda. Uh, he was visited, uh, you could view the body in the Cermak house. You go through the front door and out the back and they wore a groove through the floor. There were thousands upon thousands of people uh, who uh, mourned his death. He was a beloved mayor. He had not been mayor long, but he had been the, uh, the chairman of the Cook County Commission for some ten or so years beforehand and been a stalwart politician in, in Cook County politics before that, including, I believe, the, the chief bailiff and uh, things of that nature. Self-made man. He started out in the mines, born in Bohemia, came as a child. Um, he uh, was, was fired in the mines and so uh, for asking for a raise. And uh, the, the foreman said, the only raise you're going to get is in that elevator. Get out of here. And uh, that was the end of his mining career. And uh, then he started uh, selling firewood and things of that nature. He built a, a, an entrepreneurial uh, fortune for himself in real estate, banking, and various things. Uh, he replaced, I was saying that he's the first boss, uh, elected uh, uh, boss of, um, I think, uh, in US history. I can't think of any other bosses that were elected. But bossism was a, a tradition in, in uh, big city politics in those days, all the way into the other places, uh, right into the 40s with Pendergrast and, uh, and again, of course, Richard Daly. Richard Daly Sr. was not a protege of Cermak, but was a protege of a protege of Cermak. Cermak was elected mayor, and he was also the Democratic Party boss. He replaced a fellow by the name of Big Jim Flanagan, I think his name was, and he was a corrupt, crooked mayor who was the Capone mayor. And, uh, and it was at this particular point in time, the early 30s, before uh, uh, Cermak was uh, elected, or at the time he was elected, that, that Capone was, uh, was prosecuted for tax evasion and, and jailed in uh, Alcatraz or Atlanta. And the head of the mob in Chicago at that time, at the time of Cermak's shooting, was Frank Nitti. And of course, there was always speculation that Zangara was really after Cermak. Well, I don't believe it. I found nothing that would indicate it. There was a worldwide investigation. They investigated. J. Edgar Hoover investigated this to such detail that it would, it would make tears come to your eyes. Everybody that had any knowledge whatsoever, or maybe even possible knowledge, from people who overheard uh, remarks at a train station to taxi cab drivers. My favorite was uh, some fellow who, uh, who informed on two taxi cab drivers in, uh, in New York City who were, sent, who, was, who were complaining that the Zangara's aim was bad. He should have had target practice. And uh, you know, he thought that the taxi cab drivers, were, the New York taxi cab drivers were rude. So uh, I guess it, even in 1933, that was a common complaint, but that got to Hoover as well. They found no evidence of any kind of conspiracy with the mob or any connection with the mob, nothing whatsoever that would indicate, in fact, they never found that uh, Zangara had ever even been to Chicago. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I think that if they had found a connection, they would have told us about it. It would have come out and, uh, and uh, they would have made something of it. And, and I'm, and I'm relying upon that aspect of the nature of the thing that it would have come out. Now, so that's uh, the thing I wanted to mention about Zangara. But the, the earlier shot was of um, Dan Hardy. 
who was the sheriff. He was sort of like a cowboy sheriff. He was a, a rough and ready kind of guy. And, uh, and the funny thing about it is that uh, he took the first statement of Zangara that night in the courthouse. Uh, and in the book, which is not in the book, it was in the manuscript, is the story of uh, Dixie Herlong Chastain. Judge Her uh, Dixie Herlong Chastain. Well, her name was Dixie Herlong then. She was a young woman in her early 20s, and she was a court reporter. And she was out there that night and with her mother, uh, wandering around, and I think she was spotted by somebody, and they said, come with us, come with us. We, we, we need you upstairs. They need you upstairs in the jail. They needed her to take the statement of, uh, of uh, Zangara. And so in those days, they didn't have the little machines to take things down. They took them down in shorthand on a, on a steno pad. I interviewed her in her retirement in her home in Bay Point when I was preparing this book. I think I knew more about the event at that point in her life than she did. But she did remember several things that, uh, that were a little illuminating. She remembered that he spoke in a very thick accent. She had a hard time understanding him. And, uh, and as she did at that time with, uh, with uh, uh, witnesses that were black, and in those days they, they, it was difficult to understand Southern blacks, uh, she cleaned it up. So the transcript, as you read it, and it, it, it survives, it's, uh, and I quoted it extensively, at least I did in the manuscript, uh, uh, he seems to speak a little bit better than he really speaks. So those were the two insights that she gave. But they, they, any, in any event, later on, as you know, she, became, uh, she went to law school and then ultimately became a circuit judge, and I believe the first female circuit judge in Dade County history. Uh, but that's, that's one of the little uh, local vignettes about, uh, about her. Dan Hardy took a statement that was almost comic. He was speaking so far down to this Italian immigrant, uh, as you can sort of, sort of see on the tape there, uh, he was uh, talking uh, to him, and he, he began to tr talk to him in, in a kind of uh, pigeon Spanish. Uh, using a language that not even the people who spoke, spoke Spanish would understand, you know, El Grand Mayor, uh, for the mayor of, uh, of, of, of Chicago, El Grand Mayor. Well, in uh, in uh, Italian, the word is sindaco, for mayor. At one point, I think uh, Zangara gets annoyed with it, and he says, speak to me in English. <laughs> so uh, that, that sort of put a little humor into it at the, at the time. But he was very uh, forthcoming, Zangara was. But one of the conclusions that I reach with regard to Zangara's reason why he did this, and I think it's important, is that he improvised this response. He was committing suicide. He was committing suicide by cop. We call it that today, but in those days, remarkably, people just could not grasp that, that there are people who want to die. Zangara was down to his last few dollars. He had no work. He had his stomach cramps. Uh, he didn't have any kind of religious belief whatsoever. He says he believed in the moon, he believed in the, in the, in the, in the, in the earth, and that's it. There was nothing else. And uh, he had no uh, uh, concept he, uh, of, of, of any kind of afterlife. So although he was raised as a Catholic in, uh, in southern Italy, uh, he had rejected that. So he wanted to commit suicide, and the information that I was able to get on a sort of a, a second-hand basis, and I'll explain that, was that he was questioning his friends, what friends he had, he said he had no friends, but he had people that were friendly to him in Miami, about how to commit suicide, jump off a bridge, take poison. And what he did was he went over to Davis's pawn shop on Miami Avenue, and I don't remember the date, early February, and he bought this pistol for $8. He bought it before he knew that Roosevelt was coming to town. He bought it before Roosevelt knew he was coming to town. It didn't show up in the newspapers until shortly before the event occurred. He had bought the gun for a purpose. At first, and it's the only time I caught him in the transcripts disseminating, or uh, dissembling rather, uh, his, uh, he, he was lying. When he was directly asked that night, when did you buy the gun? Well, I don't remember. I don't. Did you buy it before or after he was in the paper? Oh, it was after, after I, I heard about Roosevelt. 
Well, they went and, and they investigated the police. They, they went and found Davis. They had the receipts. They knew exactly when he bought it and when they confronted him with it. And he come, came up with a brand new story. He had bought it so that he could go to Washington to shoot Hoover. Well, that's ludicrous. First of all, he was in Florida because the cold weather aggravated his stomach condition. He couldn't stand cold weather. And it was one of the coldest winters in, the, in, the, in, in recorded memory in 1933. It was snowing in, in Washington. And besides which, he knew that Hoover was leaving office in a few weeks. Uh, I don't, uh, but he claimed that he'd gone there. He waited, but he couldn't get near Hoover because the tall man was standing around and protected him. Couldn't get close enough to him. Well, that didn't happen, and, and, and also he made it, had a third story when he wrote his memoir in the death uh, house that uh, stated that he'd done this at some time previously in time, not, uh, not then. So he was making that up. The reason he was making it up is that he did not want to tell the authorities his reason for trying to shoot uh, uh, Roosevelt, and which was that he wanted to die. He did not expect to live through the event. And he stated that. He, he let it slip every now and then, if you read it carefully. He lets it slip. He's not that clever. He's not that guileful. And so when he says that he expected to die, and he was sort of surprised that he was still alive after the shooting, then he had to explain himself. I have no doubt he had probably sat around the, 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 the table with a glass of vino with, with the boys, and they chit-chatted about whether how the world should be a better place, and. Uh, you know, that was with, of a time when you had people who had the, the, the master plan, the grand solution to all of the world's problems. Great Depression. You got people like Mussolini, who was a school teacher, and now he was running Italy. You got the, uh, the, the, the paper hanger corporal from uh, Germany, who's running Germany. Uh, so uh, he had his solution, and the solution was to kill all the capitalists, the dirty capitalists. No money, just bread. Of course, there's poor people and there are poor hungry kids and so forth. And so if you kill all the leaders, you get rid of government. But are you a communist? No, I'm not a communist. He doesn't know what a communist is, really. He's never read any communist literature, mainly because he doesn't read like that. He's a self-educated man. He was not educated as a child, but he's not stupid. He is intelligent. He's, a, he's uh, interviewed in the jail by a presidential advisor who wanted to figure out who this guy was. And one of the evidences that we have of his intelligence is that in those days, it, you, in order to become a citizen of the United States, you had to reside in the United States a full five years, and then you had to apply for citizenship then, and then you had to go through a process and take tests where you could speak English, where you, could, you knew American history and government to at least a certain degree, and you could pass these tests in English. He did this in one year. All of that he did in one year, which apparently, according to the witnesses, was remarkable that somebody could do this in six years. So from 1921 to 1927, in 1927 he became a citizen of the United States. So I believe that his purpose was suicide. And I think that the, the, the people of Dade County and of the state of Florida and the United States at that time didn't understand that or wouldn't and still can't understand that there are some people who, are, who commit crimes for the purpose of being executed and some people who commit crimes, whether or not for that purpose, would rather be executed than spend the rest of their life in prison. And that was going to be in the book and the book was in the manuscript, the script it is, and, uh, and it was to be a commentary on the issue of capital punishment as it is viewed today. And I think that this, this, uh, this story is about is topical about capital punishment because this is a man who wanted to die, and that's what we gave him exactly what he what, we, what he, he wanted. Uh, we executed him, and we did it in record time, the swiftest legal execution in the United States in the 20th century. Uh, by Dan Hardy, that the sheriff there, who was also, by the way, the executioner by Florida law, so he pulled the plug or the switch rather. Uh, he was being driven there early in the morning. They arrived at, uh, at Rayford, at Lockheed, and they're driving toward the, the prison, but that time it was called the Florida State uh, Prison Farm. It was the only uh, prison in Florida, a penitentiary in Florida. It was rather a, a ramshackle, a primitive affair. And uh, the, out in the fields, there was a row of prisoners all dressed in their stripes. They wore stripes back then. Yeah, pushing a plow 
being pulled by a mule. They're all in a row going across the field. And Dan Hardy says to Zangara, Joe, how'd you like to do that for the rest of your life? I'd rather be dead. You know, that, 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 he sort of says. That, uh, and that's really might have been the punishment that he, that he didn't want to get. And, uh, there's the, the attorneys. Twyman is at the top. Alfred Rea, the Italian-speaking lawyer, in the middle. And I want to say a, lot, a, a bit more before this is over about these three guys. And this is James McCaskill uh, at the bottom. Twyman and McCaskill are Southerners. One of them is from Virginia, the other is from Louisiana. Uh, Raya is from uh, up north in New York, someplace like that. And he's a real estate attorney. He doesn't know criminal law. These other two guys, they didn't specialize in those days in criminal law and this or that. So these other two guys had, had done uh, a criminal law before. And I may have said that one of them was the, was the president of the Dade County Bar Association. The other one was the past president of the Dade County Bar Association. They were distinguished lawyers. But what they did in the defense of Giuseppe Zangara was a shame. They, they disgraced themselves. The one I feel sympathy for was Alfred Raya. Alfred Raya really was not a criminal lawyer. He did his best. He spoke out for Zangara. And then after that, uh, 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 Twyman, um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, McGaskill, gave a, uh, um, a little bit of a closing argument in line with what Raya had said, trying to get the judge to change his mind, to, to uh, give him life in prison as opposed to the death sentence. But I'm going to read to you what Twyman said. And that's what I'd like to do at some point in time if we've got the time in this thing. And uh, since this is the 11th Judicial, uh, bar, 11th Judicial Circuit uh, Historical Society, I'd like, to, I'd like to have that. I'm sure that possibly with the exception of Raya, because I have a soft spot in my heart for poor uh, Alfred Raya, uh, maybe not because he's Italian, but because he really was a fish out of water. He was the Italian-speaking lawyer. He was the translator. There he is in his uniform. Uh, Giuseppe Zangara was a, was a labor conscript during World War I. He was too young to be in the military, so they sent him up to, uh, to uh, northern Italy, and he helped dig the Trento Line, which was a famous uh, line, trenches, and a famous battle. And then after the, the First World War, he was conscripted and, and, and drafted into, the, uh, into a mandatory one-year or two-year term in the Italian Army, where he served as a... Uh, uh, essentially, he served as a, uh, a valet to a captain and his wife. This is one of the last, this is the last photograph taken of Giuseppe Zangara. This was taken in the courtyard of the, of the block, or the, uh, the, I forgot the name, it had a nickname. It's all poured concrete, and this is the death house, and it's two buildings that had just been built. He's probably one of the first people executed there. It's brand new. And he's in this courtyard in between. They take, take this picture. Now, he got there. He was executed within eight days of him getting there. To get him to, to get this photograph, get it developed, and then I have the original with his signature on the back. They actually, he signed the back of it, probably the last signature of his life. Now that one I showed to a psychologist, who was one of my references in the book. And uh, you know, on whether or not this fellow, a criminal psychologist, testifies in criminal courts all the time, in Broward County and Dade County. And, uh, he, he, he says, you know, he, he read a lot of the material and so on and so forth, but he said, just look at this picture. This man is not insane. Look at his eyes. Look at him. He's enjoying himself. <clears throat> He's looking at his clippings. Most people don't know or never heard of Dark Horse Dave Schultz. Dave Schultz was the governor of, of um, Florida. Those days he only served one term. He got elected and inaugurated just a month before this shooting. He was elected in the same election that FDR was elected. Dave Schultz is Florida's only Jewish governor by her uh, heredity. He was born in the Bronx, or Brooklyn, went to Yale, came south to Daytona Beach, and became an Episcopalian. And uh, he ran against a former governor who was a favorite. But the former governor apparently annoyed uh, the, the people of Florida sufficiently by using uh, anti-Semitic tactics. And so Schultz, who was the long shot, 
got the nomination. Of course, if you got the Democratic nomination in Florida, you won the election. There wasn't any Republicans. And so he became the, uh, the New Deal governor of Florida. Before it gets too late, I would really like to get to the, to the issue of the attorneys and their uh, involvement, and also to the issue of the, the, of the doctor's blunder. And let you be the judge. And it's in the book. Uh, it's, it, it, it's in any, whatever way the editor put it in the book. I mean, allowed it in, took things out, and changed things a bit in, in, in the order. The book is my book. Don't get me wrong. It's, I wrote the book. But, uh, you know, it, it was edited. Hawthorne, Vernon Hawthorne, calls the doctors onto the stand to testify as to the cause of death. Next on the stand were three doctors were the three doctors, Woodard, Nichols, and Snyder. Each testified that Zangara's bullet had killed Cermak. Quote, the death, I believe, was due to the gunshot wound in the right chest, Dr. Snyder said. You, had, uh, you have made reference to a colitis and to a pneumatic condition, the prosecutor asked. Are you in a position to say that they were accelerated by the gunshot wound? Quote, I think they were the definite result of the gunshot wound, Snyder dissembled. Having helped perform the autopsy only a few days earlier, he knew there had never been any colitis. After asking him whether he had signed the medical summary, Hawthorne asked if he had participated in an autopsy. I did, the taciturn uh, Snyder replied. With that, Hawthorne offered the witness to Twyman. Twyman was the lead uh, defense attorney. The other two attorneys never said they were asked any questions of anybody. Of this most crucial witness, Twyman said, no questions. Months later, Hawthorne would tell others of having misgivings for, this, uh, for his part in this case. Perhaps evidencing these feelings, Hawthorne, who must have suspected or even known the truth regarding Cermak's death, but could not raise it himself, gave Twyman a hint by interjecting one more question. I might ask you this, doctor. Was the autopsy performed for the purpose of definitely determining the cause of death and the effect of that wound in the internal part of his body? It was, Snyder answered. Having opened the door for Twyman, Hawthorne said once again, no further questions. If it was meant for him to for him to follow up on, then he either declined the invitation or was oblivious to it. Speaking of Twyman, judging from their conduct throughout both sentencings, their comments to the press, and their general lack of strategy or defense for their client, it is doubtless that if Zangara's lawyers were aware that a cover-up was occurring, they would have participated in it in order to spare the careers and reputations of the doctors. Here's what happened. I took this, all the medical information that could be obtained on Cermak's treatment, and it was detailed. The Chicago Tribune would even tell you the names of the people who gave him blood. Who sat, they gave it from arm to arm. They tell you who the names of the people were. It was in detail, but there is no uh, medical records left. They are all gone, destroyed, whatever, including the, uh, the, uh, the autopsy. The autopsy's gone, and probably deliberately gone. What happened was, and this was uh, as a result of Dr. Bill Strait of Niagara. He was retired at the time. I don't know if he's still alive. Good. Uh, he, um, he, he got this material, spoke to colleagues of his. They went over and moved through it and came to the conclusion. First of all, the first thing he says is that bullets don't cause colitis. It's a ludicrous uh, uh, um, conclusion to think that colitis ulcerative colitis leading to death would even occur in three weeks in a hospital. The man didn't have colitis. What he had was, according to Bill Strait, uh, a bullet that went through the diaphragm, under the diaphragm, and probably creased the liver, causing the liver to infect, to uh, give off putrid uh, fluids or whatever, and created what is known as a subterranean uh, abscess that needed to be corrected. But some crony of, of, uh, of uh, Cermak told the doctors that once upon a time, uh, uh, Tony Cermak had suffered a bout of colitis. Colitis is, is an irritation of the bowel. It 
becomes uh, dangerous when it's so bad and so long, it lasts for such a long time that it becomes an ulcer, it punctures the, the, uh, the, the intestine and, and, the, and the fluids leak into the body and create peritonitis. Well, the man didn't do that in three weeks. What happened was that the doctors simply blundered. They, they should have opened the man up. They should have seen that when he was, came into the hospital, he was conducting hospital uh, or a city business from his hospital bed. He was seeing visitors. He was uh, uh, alert, aware, and then he began to deteriorate. He deteriorated slowly and more quickly and quickly. He began to puff up. Eventually, within a few days before his death, they were curious enough, I suppose, by that time, to do a probe of the area in, in his abdomen. They punctured the, ab uh, the abdomen with a probe and let out the gas, and they could tell from the odor of it that it was gangrenous, it was putrid. And they knew by then it was too late to save him. By then he was delirious, he was unconscious, he was comatose, and they couldn't save him I mean, for the day without antibiotics. So rather than to destroy their own careers, because this is world news, I mean, national news, world news, day by day is being covered by the Chicago Tribune and the, and the country. They're watching, they're carrying a death watch on You've got people out there like uh, Walter Winchell waiting to see what happens. Uh, uh, Damon Runyon is in the is there at the hospital uh, waiting to see what happens. They called it the death watch. So what they did was all seven or eight of them, some of them having nothing whatever to do with this, got together and prepared an affidavit, which they called a summary. Well, this thing doesn't exist in the law. I mean, they don't do affidavits as the cause of death. They do autopsies. What they did was they all signed it, sort of like uh, we either all hang together or we all hang separately. And so they all signed this affidavit, and that's what they testified, or what these three doctors testified to, was the affidavit. That's what they thought up until that point in time. They thought it was colitis, and that's what they were testifying to, not the result of the autopsy, which if he had been asked about the autopsy, might have had to tell the truth. And the truth was, that had they caught it earlier, they could have saved Cermak. Now, that's not to say that Zangara didn't kill Cermak. The bullet killed him, not Colitis. But it might have made a difference in the sentencing, that, it, that, he, died, that he died of a, a medical blunder rather than just the bullet alone. It was a survivable wound. As a result of uh, working and not going to school, he reasoned he had acquired a stomach condition. And quoting, that way, I make my idea to kill the president, he continued. Kill any president, king. And I have a machine gun in hand. I will kill all president and king and all capitalists and everything they take. Money I put in the fire and burn them up. Because the poor people need money. Just bread, no money. Bread is a good thing. A lot of people have millions and a lot of people haven't a nickel and little kids hungry for bread. The audience tittered with laughter as Judge Thompson laughed his gavel for order. Twyman asked him how long he had had this idea. I started when I was about 14 up, Zangara responded. Got the same thing in my mind all myself, he said proudly. That little chair moved. There was a lot of people standing up and I had no chance. And when the people get down, it gives me a chance. I jump up then. After they sat down, I jumped up the, uh, on, the, on the little chair to kill the president. The car was there, and I tried to shoot straight to the head. I have a lot of people to shoot across, and that, and, and that time my little chair moved, I think by a touch. I missed by all, all, about a quarter of an inch here and three feet there. That is why I missed Roosevelt and killed somebody else. Twyman began asking a series of questions that might have helped Zangara if that had been the attorney's objective. The defense attorney asked Zangara if he thought uh, what he had done, what he did was right or wrong. What I think, I do right, Zangara answered. I went to kill President. He was run the government. I think I was right to do it because I, I don't think I was doing wrong. Now you've got the little bit here of, uh, you know, the insanity defense. You thought you were right, Twyman persisted. Yeah, I think I am right. I have right to kill him, Zangara quietly replied. 
This would have been a good line of questioning if Twyman were trying to raise the issue of insanity and mitigation of Thompson's sentence. But Twyman had elicited from Zangara thus far might have caused Thompson to doubt whether Zangara actually knew the difference between right and wrong. It also raised the issue of irresistible impulse, a point which the judge later attempted to develop himself further. The reason for such testimony would be to try to convince the judge to show mercy, etc. You knew it was against the law. Now here's where Twyman goes. It goes beyond the uh, saving the prosecutor the trouble of following up. Twyman insisted on showing uh, not showing not just the court but the public just how defiant his client was. You knew it was against the law at the time you shot, didn't you? Twyman asked, cross-examining his own witness. If there had ever been any doubt, Zangara dispelled it then. Yes. I know the law can put me in the electric chair, but I don't care for that. I know that because I kill him, I get electric chair. I know scare electric chair, he said defiantly. But you insist you are right? It's a quiet question. Yes, I do right, Zangara repeated. I don't care if they put me in an electric chair. Nobody can change. Nobody can change you in that feeling, Twine queried. No, nobody can change my idea, Zangara said. Goes on. It goes on in that vein. Are you sorry you killed these other, you shot these other people? Well, I'm sorry because I shot, Ro uh, I missed Roosevelt. Stating the obvious, he told Judge Thompson that determining the degree of Zangara's culpability was in his hands. Well, sure. Stating that his client was a sane man, quote unquote, he characterized him as a political zealot who told the truth at every stage. He knows that he is right, Twyman said. And at the same time, he knows that he is sinning against the land of his adoption. Telling the judge that he, Twyman, was not opposed to capital punishment, he said that his client was also shockingly agreeable to the punishments which he knows he will receive. Imagine your attorney telling that to the judge about the sentence. <laughs> in other words, this defense attorney saw no impropriety in telling the judge that neither he nor his client objected to the imposition of the death sentence. As Twyman concluded, Ryan stood up and continued. Years later, his daughter would say that throughout his life, Alfred Ryan was a deeply religious man. He was also the only person that Zangara invited to the, to the execution. He didn't show up, though. Now Ryan was genuinely asking the judge for mercy on behalf of his client. He pleaded for Thompson to consider the circumstances of Zangara's sad childhood, of the boy who had lost his mother at age two, and who had been forced into labor as a farmhand at the age of six by an ignorant and uncaring father. Arguing that, quote, the death sentence will not arrive at the root of this trouble, Raya reminded the judge that had it not been for the injury he sustained as a child, the stomach ailment, and the, long life, the lifelong suffering he had endured as a result, Zangara would never have committed the crime of which he was accused. Raya personally opposed capital punishment, he said, and, and as he pleaded with Thompson to sentence Zangara to life in prison rather than death. State Attorney N. Vernon Hawthorne spoke next. No doubt that anticipating the sentence Zangara was about to receive, Hawthorne did not need to ask for the death penalty. Instead, he talked about Zangara's demeanor throughout the hearing, characterizing the smile on Zangara's face as one of defiance, and, uh, and called the, the defendant the most defiant man I have ever seen. He not only tried to kill the president-elect, but he boasted so. Concluding his brief remarks, uh, Hawthorne told the, ju the judge, I have complete confidence and abiding faith in your honor's judgment and, and, keen insight into the prop uh, and the keen insight into the problem before you. And as Mr. Twyman says, each of us should ask divine guidance. And as your honor reaches a conclusion, that the God of the nation and of, of men have mercy on this unfortunate man. I make no recommendation. I repeat, I am sure that the magnitude of this case is clear to your honor. Then McGaskill speaks, and he speaks more like, uh, like uh, uh, Raya, only a little more eloquently, trying to get a life sentence. But by this time, it was too little too late. Uh, Twyman had already poisoned it. Judge uh, Thompson thanked counsel and told him to come back in the clock the next day. And of course, we know he sentenced him to death. There was one paragraph at the very end of this that I 
want to read, this is my historical perspective on this. And maybe it's corny to agree that the uh, editor should have taken it out. She did, and it's entire. But, let, uh, but I'll let you decide. This is uh, the commentary on these, these three attorneys. The practice of law is an ancient and honorable profession. Whether in the Middle Ages, the 1930s, or the last decade of the 20th century, the legal profession embodies within it the art of advocacy in which a knowledgeable, well-educated, and articulate scholar takes up the cause of his client to promote uh, and defend that client's interest to the best of his ability. It is the lawyer's profession to use the knowledge, experience, objectivity, judgment, and skill he or she has acquired through years of experience to promote the best interest of his client, even if the client is not entirely cognizant of them. It is not necessary for the lawyer to believe in or to agree with his client's point of view, nor for him to sanction the client's acts or even to like him, in order to secure for him due process, a fair hearing, and a just or merciful disposition. On rare occasions, a lawyer receives the highest call of the profession to ably and even courageously represent and defend a client whose actions or beliefs are not only personally repugnant to the lawyer, but, also, but whose cause is offensive and repugnant to the lawyer's community at large. Harper Lee's fictional lawyer, Atticus Finch, in To Kill a Mockingbird, comes to mind. He was the small-town Southern lawyer who incurred the reproachment of his community for ably defending a black man wrongly accused of rape. There were no Atticus Finches appointed to represent children.